Do we have what it takes to stop global warming, or is it too late? Believe it or not, insurance companies could be the key. Stay tuned for Health Politics. Welcome to Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee, a weekly program exploring important trends in health. If you watched health politics before, you know that I believe that global warming is one of our most pressing health issues. It's not just about melting ice caps and rising temperatures. That much is obvious. What it really means to you and me is health risk, to the quality of the air we breathe, to our stable water supplies, to our ability to nourish our bodies with food, just about all of the things we need to live healthy lives. Recently, we asked a few fundamental questions. Is anything really being done to address this problem? Are we simply studying it and worrying about it? Where are the solutions? And is anyone taking action? What we found is that there does appear to be a gathering consensus fueled by public and private power and dollars, and still below the radar screen, that action now must replace words. And out of the range of voices from insurers to environmentalists, from venture capitalists to state legislators, the faint outline of a plan to address global warming seems to be taking shape. That's news to me, you might say. But look a little closer, and you'll see some interesting trends. What seems to be driving us toward a possible plan is the concept of convergence. Many segments of our global society are intersecting with each other, affecting each other, determining each other. And global warming provides a good case in point. Here, three very different sectors seem to be heading in the same direction and providing a glimmer of hope. The insurance industry, the energy industry, and public policy makers, specifically the folks who create our tax and land use regulations. Let's first take a look at the insurance industry's role. When it sees a threat, this industry is well known for throwing its weight behind policy solutions. Take, for example, the auto insurance industry, which pushed for state seatbelt and motorcycle helmet laws to reduce injuries. Now, U.S. insurance companies want to use the same school of thought to roll back global warming. Why? Think about it. Catastrophic weather caused by global warming has the potential to devastate the insurance industry. The numbers will help illustrate the point. Last year, Global Insurance, the world's largest industry, collected $3 trillion in premiums. U.S. policies accounted for 17% of that, which was $507 billion. Out of this, U.S. insurers shouldered weather-related disaster damages of $71 billion which was 14% of their net premium earnings. That percentage is historic, considering that in the 1960s, catastrophic losses were just 1% to 2% of premiums. And the average for the 20 years spanning 1984 to 2004 was just 3.3%. The difference in 2005, of course, was Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, which many experts now agree were tied to global warming which in turn was tied to carbon emissions. And given the fact that humans like to live in areas that happen to be most vulnerable to water disasters, plus our general lack of effective emergency preparedness and response systems, the laws of lives, of dwellings, and insurers' profits were a foregone conclusion. Needless to say, insurance companies don't want to see another year like 2005. As Evan Mills from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory put it, quotes, insurers are vulnerable and they have a stake in getting out in front of the problem, close quotes. How are they getting out in front of the problem? By coming up with ways that could reduce the effect of catastrophic weather, like through new building codes or land use policies. Some are even taking a more active role in support of the reduction of greenhouse gases. One of the world's largest insurers, Swiss Reinsurance, is offering to underwrite carbon emission credits, a system of financial rewards for businesses investing in emission reduction projects in the developing world. According to Ivo Menzinger, 
head of sustainability and emerging risk management for the company, quotes, Coverage for national catastrophe has been rising for more than 10 years, at an average rate of 9.4 percent. Climate change mitigation, or anything that helps reduce emission, would be a positive, close quotes. Action like this by insurers could be a plus for some energy companies, the second of the converging sectors. Could it take hold in the United States? When looking for tipping points, in this case a coalescence of power and money to confront global warming, population migration to high-risk areas, and resultant catastrophic loss, U.S. often eyes California for early trends. What's going on there? Chevron Corp. and Era Energy LLC are the big oil producers in California, where the state has passed legislation to cap emission outputs. But California also houses 450 smaller operations. Combined, they produce 13 percent of the nation's oil and are tied to emissions in the primary production and also in the burning of the fuel by power companies for energy. Credits for carbon emission from insurance companies would obviously be a plus in this setting. This takes us to the final sector that's converging on the growing will to address global warming, public policymakers. Again, what's going on in California is a perfect example. A voter initiative there, Proposition 87, would have raised $4 billion by taxing oil extracted in California to fund research for alternative fuels and spur sales of alternative energy. Though the proposition failed in the November election, it received more than 3 million votes statewide and spurred so much debate that policymakers all over the country can't help but take notice. With 45 percent of voters in favor of Proposition 87 and 55 percent voting against, I'm sure we haven't seen the last of proposals that are along these lines. There's obviously growing interest and support that will no doubt continue to influence policymakers and impact public policy. The name of the game in all of this is creating and responding to incentives. With the right incentives in place, a three-pronged plan begins to emerge. Number one, control emissions. Swiss Reinsurance is putting money where its mouth is with its offer to underwrite carbon emission credits for businesses investing in emission reduction projects in the developing world. And as we continue to see how things play out in California, from emission caps to alternative energy research, the end result is what matters, less carbon in the atmosphere. Number two, less energy consumption. Whether corporate or private, focusing on energy efficiency and conservation is a fast and effective way to limit carbonization of our environment. From green buildings to efficient light bulbs to proper insulation, efficiency efforts such as these could reduce greenhouse gases by a full third over the next 25 years. Number three, use public policy proactively. A fundamental re-examination of both tax policy and land use policy is required, especially in the wake of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. As the risk of harsher and more frequent bad weather continues to increase in the short term, we can't continue to put ourselves directly in harm's way. As the creators of these problems, it's now our collective responsibility to address them. Though complex, the concept of converging self-interest among very different economic and government sectors may be helping us move in that direction. For Health Politics, I'm Mike McGee. Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee. For more information on this topic, please visit our related web links, discussion guide, or downloadable transcript and slides. For videos and information on a variety of other health topics, visit our homepage at healthpolitics.org. If you would like to subscribe to our free weekly video, click on subscribe to Health Politics and enter your email address. Again, thank you for watching.